Perfect. Hopefully you're all able to see the screen now. And I just wanna say thank you and welcome to all the participants. I see the list of participants and some familiar names and people I haven't seen in a long time. And so really excited that you'll be uh, joining us for this webinar. And um, I want to basically go back on the last 10 years of my experience working with uh, adult brain slices. Um, in my mind, a lot of that is synonymous with working with the compressed tome from Precisionary Instruments. It's been my uh, brain slicer of choice for all these years. Um, but I think that largely this is going to be a look at some of the technical aspects, kind of more of the history of the development of the methodology that I've been using for the work uh, I've been doing. And um, hopefully it will be uh, informative and sharing some tips and tricks along the way and happy to answer lots of questions as well. Um, wonderful. Uh, thanks for that. And I just wanted to start by this sort of very um, general introduction to the work that I'm doing in my current research, just as a way of giving you a flavor of the type of things that I've been working on and kind of the directions that are really exciting to me. Um, the work that I've been doing at the Allen Institute is very much focused on studying the multimodal properties of brain cell types. Uh, and I've been working in various species from mouse to monkey to human, and even preparing to move more broadly into uh, different mammalian species for comparative work. But the, the majority of the work uh, in my career so far has been on mouse, uh, monkey, and human. And um, I'll explain in a little bit uh, later in the talk about the access to the human neurosurgical tissue, uh, but uh, just to say that the approach that we're using every day now is called patch seek, where we're able to record um, electrophysiology and uh, morphology through cell filling. Uh, we're also able to recover the single cell transcriptomes, and really this is a great way to probe gene function relationships and really understand the correspondence between these different data modalities. Uh, that's really at the heart of what we do. And so hopefully that's a, a good introduction to the flavor of work that I'm doing and the team here is doing. Um, and then I'll switch gears here to kind of show you this timeline of uh, the development of a lot of the methodology that I've been uh, working with, um, how this came about. Really, it was uh, just about a decade ago, 10 years ago, um, where I was working in Goping Feng's lab at MIT. I was trying to work on a lot of transgenic mouse lines, uh, also uh, mutant mouse lines to characterize the uh, defects in these lines. And I uh, was probably, I guess the best way to describe, I was struggling a lot with um, how to do these experiments uh, in these older animals and um, did a lot of testing and came across a solution that worked well. And I presented that in a poster at SFN in 2011. I'll, I'll never forget that that uh, presentation that was probably my best attended poster of any poster I've ever given. It was super surprising to me because this was just sort of supposed to be a small side project and a methodology. Um, it was also way back in the ZZZ section of the poster hall. And um, a lot of people came and were really curious about this. And I think it really um, emphasized to me that this is something that many people struggle with is how to get these healthy brain slices, not only from young animals, but for animals across the whole lifespan. And um, from there, I've just always uh, kept that in my mind that uh, this is something interesting to me that other people are interested in. I want to share my um, successes, share my, my struggles, and what kind of little improvements uh, can be made along the way. And uh, this has been ongoing now and uh, just every day still working hard at trying to improve things. And um, in 2000 and 13, I moved to the Allen Institute, uh, where I've been working for seven and a half years now, uh, largely on human tissue, and then more recently on uh, monkey tissue. And as you can see, there are a couple of different milestones here, different kind of papers and book chapters and studies that uh, illustrate different use, uses of um, adult brain slices, different uh, little tricks with the uh, brain slicers and that type of a thing. And so uh, we'll touch on some of those along the way, but uh, just to say here that this is ongoing and it's a, it's a journey. Um, so if I go back to the beginning, it was kind of fun to take a walk down memory lane and look back through actual data that I had collected a long time ago, even going back to the beginning of my postdoc. And so these are actual images of slices I prepared and 
uh, I think, you know, not very encouraging for these adult animal brain slices. Uh, but this was kind of the best uh, standard at the time. Um, I was a first year postdoc uh, trying to study intrinsic and synaptic properties uh, from a genetic mouse model of obsessive compulsive disorder. And uh, this was the SAPAP3 knockout mouse. Uh, there are, there's a picture here um, shown at the um, upper right. And these animals were getting facial lesions as a result of compulsive repetitive behavior of compulsive grooming. And the lesions would show up around four to six months of age. Um, and when I came to the lab, um, I noticed that everybody was working hard studying the synaptic properties in 21 day old mutant mice and comparing to their wild type litter mates. And I kind of asked this question, uh, why? why? Why does this make sense? If the, if the deficits are emerging in the adult animal many months later, can we expect to really see uh, what these uh, synaptic changes are uh, such, at such an early age? And the answer that I got was that it's very hard to do adult animal brain slice and that you know maybe it's a waste of time. Um, you, you probably don't wanna waste your time doing that, um, which uh, to me was basically like, thank you very much, uh, challenge accepted. I, I really wanna do that now. Um, that's kind of just how my brain works. Um, I like the challenge. Uh, I didn't know that it would be successful, but I thought it would be worth some time to try to spend on this. And so uh, here you can see some pictures of brain slices. This is just looking at the neocortex. Uh, from various ages of, of mice that, that I had cut at the time, uh, seeing how this preservation, it really falls off quite quickly uh, in the young adult age range. So, you know, a lot of people work with um, weanlings uh, around P21 to P25. That's what we were doing at the time. We were also focusing on stridal uh, region. Um, but here, at least for the cortex, you can see this illustration that you can see really nice plump neurons in the really young brain here with a P7 mouse. Uh, everything looks beautiful and patchable. Uh, when you get to weaning age, uh, you can still find really nice neurons for patching. But right around P30 is where things start to go off. And um, all of this, I should mention, is using uh, the sucrose uh, cutting method uh, that many of you are familiar with. And um, the good news was that between about P35 and one and a half year old, uh, things didn't really get that much worse. It, it pretty much was a problem of the transition from um, weaning age through young adulthood. And then in adulthood through the age brain, uh, seems like the quality of the tissue looked quite similar to me. That was my, my personal impressions. Um, others may have their own uh, experience, but you know we see a lot of these shriveled neurons, neurons that are called pycnotic, um, they're not uh, very receptive to patch clamp electrodes and you can't really record healthy uh, properties from these neurons. And so that was really the challenge. Um, and out of that came this concept of protective uh, cutting versus protective recovery. So uh, many of you know this paper, this Agajanian paper from 1989. This is where they introduced the sucrose ACSF method. Um, I uh, was very interested in following up on this, uh, especially around the same time I came in contact with Dr. Kong at uh, Precisionary, and I was aware of his work using glycerol ACSF and the compressed home, and sort of got really interested in all these different formulations and methodologies and wanted to ask the question, what is the critical step? And so we went through this workflow where we have, um, you know, IP injection, transcardial perfusion, you do the brain extraction and mount the brain for slicing. Um, after the slices are cut, they're transferred to a recovery chamber. And then you basically hold them there all day long um, until you're ready to get them on the patch clamp rig. Uh, could be from one hour to five or six hours later, maybe even longer. Um, and the experiment that was performed was really just to compare uh, what happens when you use this uh, so-called protective cutting method, uh, where you have equimolar replacement of uh, sodium with sucrose, uh, and you use that for slicing, uh, but then the slices are moved into a recovery chamber with standard ACSF at uh, 32 to 34 degrees for about 30 minutes. That's a pretty standard protocol. Um, and the alternative, which I called protective recovery, was to uh, really illustrate this, this uh, difference between cutting and recovery. 
uh, and the different formulations. So the, the slices were cut in a standard ACSF, uh, normal level of sodium, um, and then placed into the initial recovery bucket in an NMDG substituted ACSF uh, for about 15 minutes at 32 to 34 degrees. So we're kind of changing the order there of the sodium replacement from the cutting stage to the recovery stage. And um, if anyone's interested, the detailed uh, recipes are available from the website uh, that I made, brainslicemethods.com. Um, but I uh, just want to keep this very simple and show this initial result, which was a really good day in the lab for me. Um, and again, I think I just want to emphasize this point, which confuses some people, is that this is not necessarily the re re recommended um, methodology to use, but this is really something to prove the point that you don't need any protection during the cutting necessarily, that the really critical step is in this initial recovery phase right after slicing for the first 10 minutes. And so if you look at these pictures, what we did was took these slices onto the patch clamp rig. The rig has normal ACSF um, at various time points here, either five to 10 minutes after slicing or 25 to 30 minutes after slicing. These are five month old uh, mice. And with the standard sucrose cutting method, the so-called protective cutting method, you can see that there are really swollen neurons here at this early time point, completely swollen. You can see the nuclei. Uh, you can't really see any intact cells at that stage. It's not surprising because it's known that that rushing in of, of sodium and, and the passive chloride entry really causes this uh, water to come in as well and to cause swelling. Um, and then by 30 minutes later, uh, you start to see that the same cells, the same field of view, then starts to tighten up and the cells tighten up, they extrude the water, but they kind of overreact and they spit out too much and become shriveled. And so that's what you're seeing here is that the end result in these adult animals are not very patchable neurons. Um, although if you go deep in the slice, you can certainly find good neurons uh, to, to record. And in contrast, just by doing this initial recovery in the NMDG ACSF, uh, again, just emphasizing cutting in standard ACSF, the recovery only has NMDG ACSF, um, that in littermates uh, here, we can see at the similar time points that five to 10 minutes after, you can even already see a big improvement in the amount of swelling. It's much reduced uh, in these two different brain regions, cortex and striatum. And by 30 minutes later, uh, you see really nice, plump, uh, healthy looking neurons that are amenable to patching. So um, I know this is a bit much text here on this slide, but I think it's worth going through relatively quickly here, just to say that this kind of launched me into pretty much a year long endeavor of systematic variable testing, you know, doing brain slicing every day, as many of you do, um, trying to understand what is going on with all these different uh, variables. Uh, is there something else that is important or is it really just this one, could it be as simple as this one 10 minute period of the recovery? And so um, I think many of you have gone through this yourself in learning the process of uh, brain slice. Uh, but I you know, tested many solution formulations. To me, it turned out that whatever you used in slicing, it really wasn't as critical as this recovery. Um, for slicer machines, I didn't feel it was very critical. I'd used many different machines in my time. Um, but the critical point is that you have to have a machine that has low z-axis deflection, or also called zero z. Um, or pseudo zero Z, the closer, closer to zero Z, the better, because you don't have damage to the superficial parts of the slice. Um, the temperature of the slice recovery uh, sort of mattered. You could get much clearer images from the slices if you used a slightly warm temperature for 30 minutes uh, versus room temperature, uh, but really not that big of a difference. Um, the temperature of the slicing solution uh, didn't, didn't matter. I was really surprised at that. Everybody was using slushy ACSF at that time, and it would you know, take a good 30 minutes every morning trying to get that to the right consistency. So that was kind of encouraging to see that you didn't have to do that. Um, transcardio perfusion, it's helpful. I still do that to this day, but it's not absolutely necessary. Um, the speed of the transcardio perfusion didn't matter. The duration of the whole procedure wasn't really that critical. The speed of the dissection, not that critical. Even something is, that we're taught as um, critical as oxygenation during the slice prep, it was important, but I don't think that it was very critical for the short period of 15 minutes of slicing. And, and so probably uh, many of you at this point are thinking this is a little bit nuts. You know, these are 
things that we're taught we need to do. We need to move fast. We need to get the brain out fast. Everything needs to be oxygenated. Um, we need to use cold temperature. Um, I'll give you a reason why, um, a, a really strong reason why you should, you should um, keep an open mind about that and maybe uh, change your, your thinking. Um, but just to, to really highlight this point that the one really critical thing was just really as simple as this protective recovery step immediately after brain slicing was completed. And the critical thing there was that you need a sodium ion replacement. The optimal formulation was NMDG. Uh, there are other alternatives that we've investigated over the years, but I really prefer this NMDG. It was the most versatile. Um, as a general principle, if you have something with a methylated side chain, as NMDG does, that that seems to block per penetration uh, into the, the sodium channel. That's, that's kind of the concept there. But um, in a simple terms, just we want to have this sodium ion replacement with something that really does not permeate the sodium channel. Um, that's going to block the passive chloride entry. It's going to block the water influx that causes swelling. And if you don't have swelling, you don't have later shriveling. And um, also important were in this formulation were the fact that you have matched osmolarity, not equimolar replacement. If you do the equimolar replacement of say sucrose for uh, sodium chloride, you actually end up with an osmolarity that's very high compared to um, the standard ACSF. So I think that's a key point and that's been pointed out by others like uh, Moyer and Brown as well in the past. That's very critical for adult slice. And the low calcium high magnesium is, is very helpful as well. Um, one thing that I haven't really talked about a lot over the years is that NMDA receptor antagonists can really help improve viability. Um, we haven't really employed that because it's not absolutely necessary, but in cases where you have some difficulty, still you may want to uh, investigate that more. Okay, so I would like to challenge your preconceived notions with this slide here that really deals with a lot of these parameters and sort of um, the extreme case of why I'm saying that many of these things don't matter. And uh, this started with a paper that someone called out to me from over 20 years ago in PNAS um, that looks at recordings from post-mortem brain slices. And so I encourage you all to go and look at this paper. Um, it's really kind of mind blowing to me that uh, what we did was we tried to replicate some of their results because I didn't honestly believe it, that you could get brain slice recordings uh, using patch clamp from uh, cortical neurons um, for many hours after an animal had died. Uh, and then you, you wait and you, you make brain slices. So here in this experiment, what I did was I took it to another level with, instead of using young rats, I switched to six month old mice. I mean, nobody's gonna argue that these are not mature adults. These are clearly mature adults. And the experiment is one to five hour post-mortem delay before preparing the brain slices using the NMDG protective recovery method that I just described. There's no transcardial perfusion. All we do is decapitate and then let the, the, the head and the brain cool passively for one to five hours before brain dissection and slicing. Um, and here's the, some of the evidence, some of the recordings that were obtained from this little pilot study. Uh, the post-mortem delay is indicated here, one hour, three hour, five hour. Uh, you're seeing some pictures here of the brain slices of the cortex region, layer five, and some example recordings uh, at these various time points for either a cortical pyramidal neuron, layer five pyramidal neuron, these are um, generally thick tufted neurons, uh, and uh, fast spiking interneurons here in red on the bottom. Uh, you can see that you can clearly um, get these, obtain these recordings at these time points. Um, it's not just a lucky shot. Uh, this was done reproducibly across many different recordings. Uh, here's just showing like a battery of recordings and protocols applied to these uh, neurons uh, from this five hour postmortem time point. Um, and they were really rock stable and just, I couldn't believe it. So I think that really illustrates that many of these things that we've been ingrained with are um, not, not to say that they're not a good idea. I think uh, they're good ideas. It's a good idea to use cold temperature. It's a good idea to work quickly. But uh, ever since I've done this, I haven't necessarily rushed when I go through my procedure. I'm more concerned with being methodical and you know following the exact protocol that I want to follow more so than rushing this thing through. So um, yes, I think that uh, this is a, a good segue into sort of tips and tricks and things that can further improve upon the base 
uh, protocol. So we have this base protocol. Um, it works very well for adult animals. Um, what I heard from a lot of people initially was that there's some difficulty with getting gigaohm seals using this NMDG protective recovery. Um, I think a lot of those people were people working with relatively young mice. Like, for example, the obvious thing to try is you're working with 21 day old animals. You want to switch to this method. So you just use what you're normally used to using. You try this protective recovery. Some people had difficulty with getting seals. So I wanted to help um, try to understand and solve that problem. And we published a Jove article. Um, it's helpful to have this video where you can see the process, but also extending the method uh, for a way to overcome this, where you could use this same protocol across any animal age. And the principle was basically to just do a slow reintroduction, gradual reintroduction of sodium. We call it a sodium spike in um, with a, a set time course um, after the during this initial recovery phase, this 10 minute period. Um, and so if you're working with young animals, this uh, reintroduction would be a little bit quicker here, as shown in the black line on the right panel here in B. Uh, and if you're working with a really old animal, then you would want to gradually do that even in a slower process over a longer time. And the idea was that the younger tissue could tolerate this faster reintroduction of sodium, whereas the older tissue could not. Um, and if you uh, do this in even a 21 or 30 day old, 21 to 30 day old animal, um, it can really help with the speed of the gigaohm seal formation. So here in uh, the left side here, panel A, you can see what we're measuring here is the gigaohm seal time. So this is a time from when the patch pipette uh, touches the cell and you see the dimple and you release the positive pressure, um, starting the clock at that point until the time that you get a stable gigaohm seal. And what we found was similar to what was reported that with these younger animals, we had cells that were stalling out and we just capped it at 100 seconds and said, OK, that's not going to ever form. Um, there was a smattering of cells that could not form gigaohm seals quickly. And when we used this uh, NMDG recovery method plus the sodium spike in, we were able to then see that all of the cells could form gigaohm seals really rapidly. And the average time to gigaohm seal was 10 seconds. So this was very helpful for methods like multi-patching where you need to have success on a number of pipettes in a row in order to get the data that you need. Um, and we were uh, actually working on some of that uh, in the human slices at the time and, and uh, also able to confirm that that was useful for mouse and human multi-patching. Uh, another useful tip was that if you're working in a brain area that's particularly susceptible to oxidative stress, uh, hippocampus is a good example of that, but I'm sure there are many others, um, that these areas tend to be harder to get recordings from, and especially as the day goes on, you know, two hours, three hours, four hours into the experiment where the slices are sitting there incubating, um, I was also finding that CA1 pyramidal neurons were hard to get gigaohm seals on. Sometimes they become rigid, uh, meaning that you're approaching them with a patch pipette and you're not able to get a dimple, which is uh, prohibitive for getting your whole cell recording. And I wondered, what was this about? And uh, long story short, my uh, impression was that what happens here is that the preservation is so high in the slices using this um, NMDG recovery method that you have much higher levels of excitatory and inhibitory uh, spontaneous synaptic transmission. And it seemed like it was plausible that this was causing oxidative stress and damage onto these neurons, especially neurons like CA1 pyramidal neurons that have very high levels of NMDA receptors. And so I did this experiment to measure for um, neuronal glutathione through the surrogate of C5 maleamide, which is a, a way to detect reactive thiols. And it's thought that the main reactive thiol here is neuronal glutathione. So you can see here with the fluorescence images that um, if you start out one and a half hours after slicing, which is when a lot of people start their recordings, that the reactive thiols are very high, suggesting neuronal glutathione is high. And by uh, the end of the day, a lot of this is depleted. And you see that in the fluorescence being diminished here in the CA1 pyramidal layer, also in the granule cell layer to a lesser extent and in the cortex. And um, this seems to correlate very nicely with the, the, the difficulty with getting recordings later on. Um, as a side point, I thought this was really curious because I always noticed in the dentate gyrus that there's a good, good part and a bad part of the um, dentate gyrus as far as um, seeing healthy cells for patch clamp. And 
it kind of alternated day to day. It's not always the upper blade or the lower blade. It's just one blade or the other is good. And if you flip the slice over, it's usually the other opposite part of the dentate gyrus that's healthy. And I, I couldn't understand what would cause that. Um, as hard as I could try, it's hard to make slices that have both good upper and lower blade. And I think here, this kind of illustrates that the depletion seems to be selective from one side or the other. And that may relate to the exact angle of slicing and whether the neurons are fully preserved in their morphology or whether the dendrites are severed and trun are truncated. And that could be causing uh, acceleration of this glutathione depletion. Um, the solution for this was to try to find ways to restore neuronal glutathione. And so uh, this is just illustrating the biosynthetic pathway for glutathione synthesis. Uh, glutathione is abbreviated here, GSH. And uh, we came up with two different ways to um, uh, bolster neuronal glutathione. One was directly by just using a cell permeable glutathione, glutathione ethyl ester. Um, if it's just glutathione reduced, that cannot cross the cell membrane. So you need this ethyl ester group to make it cross the membrane and get into the neurons. Or alternatively, because this is cost prohibitive, uh, we could also use um, N-acetyl L-cysteine, um, which can cross into the cell and uh, feed into this biosynthetic pathway and restore levels of neuronal glutathione. Um, the level of um, kind of neuroprotection afforded here is plotted along this uh, colored heat map here that L-acetyl-L-cysteine and glutathione ethyl ester performed very well at these mentioned concentrations. Glutathione reduced, as I mentioned, it didn't have any impact. It just couldn't get in. And if you tried to use L-cysteine uh, outside of the cell, it actually was neurotoxic. So it's important that it's N-acetyl-L-cysteine and not L-cysteine directly. Um, and then basically all you're doing is supplementing either NAC or glutathione ethyl ester across all of these different stages uh, of the transcardial perfusion, brain slicing, recovery, and sitting in the holding chamber um, until you're ready to use. And I think the earlier, the better for bolstering the levels of glutathione. And um, I, the ultimate conclusion of this was that just a simple solution like this supplementation could allow you to have brain slices that are stable and that survive all day long and actually even into the next day. So um, again, not advocating that people do 24 hour brain slice recordings, but just to really demonstrate the point, uh, I did this pilot study where I was recording from brain slices prepared of a seven month old mouse uh, using the NMDG protective recovery method, um, using glutathione ethyl ester su supplementation um, and showing that you can get recordings from various cell types at 24 hour time point um, these were stable recordings. You could see uh, the signature properties of these different cell types are maintained. Uh, also pointing out that the high rate of spontaneous uh, EPSCs shown at the bottom um, confirm that there is really high preservation of functional synapses. It's not just that you can measure intrinsic properties, but that the synaptic properties are maintained as well. So at that point, this was getting very close here to the end of my postdoc. So this is a long time period, about five years, um, developing, uh, perfecting, trying to implement for the research. We use this in a number of studies, but then basically it's kind of like, okay, this is as far as I could take this. Uh, we're recording up to 24 hours long in mouse brain slices from adult mice. Where do you go from there? Uh, I was really excited when I was contacted by um, people from the Allen Institute. Uh, Jim Berg was the first one that contacted me through the website asking about brain slice for adult animals. Um, and also Ed Lean, who ultimately hired me. Um, they were working on developing this really new program at the Allen Institute, which we now know as the Cell Types Program. Um, and there's a database that was developed called the Allen Cell Types Database. And the goal here was to um, study the mouse and the human cortex together in parallel and to build this, uh, these data pipelines and platforms for studying electrophysiology, morphology, and transcriptomes of single cells. Um, at that time, uh, Jim was the first patch clamper, I think, hired into the Institute. There really wasn't much of a reputation for patch clamp recording. It, it, it wasn't clear to me 
um, how successful this program would be. Uh, the human tissue was something novel. I had no idea if that was going to last for six weeks or if that was going to last for um, six years. And uh, so that was an exciting opportunity to try to get in there at an early stage and apply this methodology and see if this could help with building a robust reproducible pipeline. I think that was very logical to me that this is a really great application and next step for this technology. And fortunately, my colleagues at the Institute were really happy to adopt this, this um, approach in the brain slicing. So we, um, as, as many of you know, we've developed these pipelines. We now have data product online. I mentioned the cell types database, which is available here at celltypes.brain-map.org. Um, and we continue to develop new resources, uh, including patch seek data from mouse and human and uh, synaptic connectivity data, um, et cetera. Um, and I don't have a lot of time to elaborate on all of the details of um, uh, the process of building the pipeline, and um, there's some modifications that were made for the mouse pipeline to the, the solution formulations, but just want to summarize here in one slide the, the upshot here of, of major effort over many years now. This is about five years worth of work in the mouse scaled pipeline. So the goal is high throughput patch clamp recording in adult brain slices. The animal age is around P40 to P, I guess P45 here to P70. And all of this work was done with the NMDG protective recovery method and using compressed foam BF300. And uh, in this first study that was published uh, just a year, about two years ago in uh, 2019, uh, that study had almost 2,000 neurons with single neuron patch clamp. And you can see big gallery of lots of the EFIS and morphology recorded from these cells. This was our morphoelectric characterization study. This is the work of over 100 um, of my colleagues uh, working together to kind of do this big, big data um, thing here. And then more recently, just uh, in 2020, uh, we had our first uh, paper on patch seek in the mouse. Um, this was published in Cell, and you can again see big gallery of lots of different traces of diverse neuron types in the neocortex. And all of this was for the visual cortex in the mouse. Um, that was a study of over 4,000 GABAergic neurons. And again, this is, um, um, this is a, a process that involves quality control. Uh, there's a lot of attrition for cells that are not good enough. So these are the final numbers after all the quality control. You can imagine all the recordings that go into that to arrive at this final number. And so, yes, uh, this was a really great demonstration of the power of the method for getting healthy slices, for being able to sample diverse cells with diverse properties and see that their intrinsic properties are maintained. The morphologies are um, easily distinguishable. Um, so in my mind, um, I feel uh, confident that uh, this has really been vetted and that this method um, is very strong and that this has helped us with our throughput and being able to achieve these numbers. Um, the other point is coming back to the human neurosurgical tissue. This is the thing that I came here to work on uh, myself as the main thrust of my own work, um, trying to develop this platform using tissue donated from patients undergoing neurosurgery. Uh, this is just a diagram showing that we often get tissue from the middle temporal gyrus uh, as surgeons are tunneling down to get tissue from the uh, epileptic focus of the hippocampus, the overlying cortical tissue can be removed and used for research. Uh, it's not necessary for diagnostic purposes. And so you can see we can get these blocks of tissue, we can slice them, uh, in this case using a compressed zone VF200. Um, and we can do the same thing of recording the, the electrophysiological properties and filling the cells and getting their morphology. Uh, this is just a little gallery uh, sampling of the types of diverse neurons that we can record with their beautiful morphologies, uh, all work of my colleagues here, uh, especially work of morphology team and electrophysiology core. And um, in the process of doing this pipeline, one of the really uh, interesting findings was that uh, the human ex vivo brain slices are extremely robust and they are very viable in the sense that they last for much longer than mouse uh, slices do. And so I was prepared, I'm going to have to apply all of these tricks, I'm going to have to try to find a way to extend the health of these neurons, um, like I did in the mouse, uh, adult mouse brain slices. But in fact, the truth of the matter is that human tissue is just inherently more robust than uh, mouse tissue. And 
in spite of the fact that, you know, we're talking about 50, 60, 70 year old human patients that are donating tissue. Um, so these are blocks of tissue that have matured for many, many decades uh, in, in, in a person's uh, head. And um, so that sort of uh, really uh, puts it into perspective. We're comparing sort of the extreme end of two years of lifespan of a mouse to a hundred year lifespan of human. And looking at some of these um, recordings, it was really exciting to see that you can go 10 hours, 24 hours, 40 hours, even 74 hours after we were able to get these types of recordings and see that the properties could be measured and assayed. And um, so, like I've said before, this is not an, this is not a recommendation to be doing these long-term recordings, but the, the motivation was, how do you extend the window of opportunity for working with these precious samples? And so this is just a demonstration that these properties can be measured. There are some subtle changes that happen, but uh, all in all, a lot of the properties can be measured and maintained in a stable state. Um, this led to the idea that we can culture these tissues. Uh, it becomes semantics then about whether it's an acute slice anymore. You're already maintaining it on the countertop for two or three days. Uh, might as well go ahead and put that into a brain slice culture in the incubator, try to keep them alive for a week or more, um, which would op open up opportunities for viral genetic labeling. And so what we did was just move all of the slicing set up into the hood. We um, uh, you can see here all the different various components. They might look a little different than your normal slicing station. Uh, importantly, we switched to disposable plasticware, things that were one-time use, sterile. Um, we used um, stainless steel buffer tray for the compressed tone because that could be removed and cleaned and autoclaved. Uh, and that really worked well for being able to maintain sterility and to keep these cultures going in the incubator. Uh, in interface culture, using these millipore membrane inserts um, with a standard kind of incubator conditions of 95% air, 5% CO2. And I believe this is my, my last slide here of showing uh, this kind of promise for human cellular neuroscience that we can have these cultures, we can record from them at several days in culture, uh, we can apply viruses. Uh, in, in the earliest days, we used HSV uh, because it was very rapid, but we've switched to doing a lot of work with uh, adeno-associated virus and enhancer vectors for cell type specificity. But uh, in those earliest days, I was able to show we could do GCAMP imaging and you can stimulate these cells and see a nice response uh, of the increase in the fluorescence of the um, GCAMP. Um, we can do optical control with channel rhodopsin. Uh, these are at a couple of days in culture, but with the AAV, we were also able to go much longer. Um, the goal here is to bring the, the tools that are well known for the mouse here to the human slice culture, um, trying to get away at doing genetic dissection of, of cell types and circuits. And so the goal in my case is not long-term culture, uh, but short-term culture where we can get this viral genetic label and study the slice in its healthiest, most preserved state as possible. And so we've developed some viruses, for example, that can turn on even within less than two days. Uh, this is an example of one vector for GABAergic labeling that we're able to see labeling in 40 hours and patch clamp some neurons and confirm that these are GABAergic neurons. Um, there's a lot of work ongoing about this uh, at the Allen Institute. Uh, and I would just um, mention that some of this will be uh, published soon, but there are studies that are on BioArchive if people are interested. There's a lot of uh, additional detail that you can find in those studies. Um, but with that, I want to stop here to make sure that we have lots of time for discussion and to answer questions from the chat. So I want to thank all of my colleagues at the Allen Institute. Um, some of you I can see on this call, um, people like um, Nick D and Jim Berg, um, Brian Lee, Stacy Sorensen, Brian Kombach. These are all really um, critical people working either in the pipeline development uh, for the single neuron morphology and electrophysiology um, or on my own team. Um, uh, it's a big effort, uh, but also want to thank uh, the uh, collaborators uh, at the hospital sites for helping with establishing this human neurosurgery, neurosurgery program where we can get access to tissue for human brain slice recordings. And uh, lastly, want to thank my former postdoc advisor, Guoping Feng. A lot of the work here shown was actually from data collected while I was in his lab. 
and also um, colleagues that worked with me there. Uh, that was a really fun time in developing these approaches. Uh, so with that, I'll conclude and um, want to show a slide here just that I've compiled some resources for those of you who are maybe less familiar or would like to follow up with additional um, uh, tips and tricks and details about the methodology. Uh, there are a lot of resources that we've shared over the years, and uh, this is just pointing you to where you can find these, uh, including the website that's still active and um, uh, various papers and SOPs that you can find. Great. Jonathan, thank you so much for your talk today. Learn a lot about uh, brain slices and how to improve them and what matters and what may not actually matter as much. I actually did a lot of electrophysiology in my grad uh, grad school years, and you definitely um, shook some of my uh, core beliefs right there. Um, I have some um, questions from um, our group today, and anybody, um, please do uh, feel free to type in your question to the chat box. I'm going to start in order. So the first one is, um, and you talked about uh, about this a little bit, um, which is how critical is the transcardial perfusion step in the overall process in making brain slices? Yes, that's a question that I've received a lot over the years. I think that it can be a little bit intimidating for some people. It's obviously time consuming. Um, my feeling is that uh, it is definitely helpful um, if for no other reason, if you're working with fluorescent proteins, you'll want to clear that blood out because there's a lot of autofluorescence that you get from leaving blood in the tissue. Um, so it's certainly helpful in that way to get uh, much clearer tissue. Um, and as far as the quality of the, the slice and the health of the slice, I think there are some, there are certain things that were done here along the way to really prove a point to say, is this really necessary? Maybe it's not the critical or most critical thing. But uh, my take is still that some things are very helpful and certainly transcardial perfusion, if you feel comfortable doing that, I think can only help things. Great. And related to again on uh, slice or cell quality, um, have you ever tested agar temperature? Because when you use a compressed room, you have to embed the brain in agarose or agar. How does that temperature affect slice or cell quality? So I am a fan of the empirical method. Um, I have never gone through and measured the different temperatures and seen, you know, at what point does the temperature get too hot. What I can say is that I set my heat block, I use like a little heat block to heat Eppendorf tubes that are filled with agarose. Um, I used to use a thermal mixer, but you know, we also sometimes use just a static heat block. Um, I set the temperature to 42 degrees C, uh, which scares some people because it's starting out kind of hot. But um, that's what we do empirically. We see that we get great results. We, we don't have cooked tissue at the surface, uh, for example. Um, and that the results are, the, the proof is in the result, right? We have thousands and thousands of recordings now using this methodology um, where we do it exactly the same way every day. Um, many brain regions, many cell types, many species. And so I would say you certainly don't want to get too hot, but um, if you're starting from 42 and you're working your way down from there, you know, you could use whatever temperature below 42 works for you, but I found that 42 is a good temperature to keep the agarose so it doesn't accidentally solidify uh, when you're at the critical stage of getting ready to embed the tissue. Right, right. Thanks. And uh, we had a question about storing and making the cutting and recovery solutions. Is it necessary to prepare cutting and recovery solutions on a daily basis, or can they be preserved for a couple of days? Well, I uh, keep my solutions for about a week. Um, I have told people that it's helpful that you have ascorbic acid in there um, and other ingredients that sort of will change color. And so if you keep your solution too long, you'll be able to see that when you start to see the color change, that's a good indication it's time to move on to a new batch. But uh, in my case, um, for our work, we usually make the, we try to make it as fresh as possible, but it's not practical to make it every single day. If you've only used half of it, and you wanna use it again for the next animal. I think I, I fully endorse that. Um, but you know, it depends on what your experiment is, right? If you're doing practice recording, you're probably not gonna care if it's fresh or it's a week old. Um, maybe even you're willing to risk two weeks old. 
But if you're doing your most critical experiment on a rare and precious piece of tissue, I think that our take is that if it's a really critical experiment that you wanna make it up fresh. Right, use the best ingredients, right? That's right, you don't wanna give any other excuse for failure. Uh, there are enough excuses already just in the inherent biological variability. So uh, I would say when you're ready to do your really critical experiments, you, you wanna to try to use the freshest solution you can. And um, I also encourage people that the more you make this recipe, uh, the faster you get. And so it really shouldn't take more than 10 minutes a day making up your, your solutions. Excellent, thank you. Um, another question we have is, do you have any tricks to prevent the agros from sticking on the brain slice when using the compressed home? We have somebody here who uses 2% agros for cutting and any uh, tips and tricks for getting the agros rim to come off? That's a great question. Uh, a little nuance of, you can tell somebody who's a compressed home user. That's right. Um, I think I discovered this trick on accident. Um, when I first started, I had the same problem. I was making up the agros in water. I was using Milliku water, thinking that that's the best thing. You just want to be really uh, pure water, but uh, definitely will stick to the tissue a lot more than if you use ACSF, or in particular, we recommend using the NMDG ACSF uh, or even PBS. I, actually, I think now we're mostly using PBS uh, for making that uh, agros, and then we let it solidify and um, cut it down and melt it uh, each day for use. And if you do that, you'll find that the tissue does not stick nearly as much. There's still a little stickiness, but with a little bit of effort, just sucking with a, a cut off plas plastic pasture pipette, you'll get those slices to come off easily. Oh, that's great. So instead of making it with like distilled water, just simply making it with PBS can help you have an agros rim that just kind of slides off after each slice. That's my experience. Great. We're definitely going to be incorporating that in our recommendations for our Comprestum customers. Um, and if you have time, can we ask a few more questions, Jonathan? Absolutely. Great. Um, we have somebody here who um, clearly also does patch clamping. Um, uh, they asked, have you compared different patch solutions uh, besides potassium gluconate, such as cesium or potassium chloride? Yes, uh, it's been a long time, I have to say, because we've been using K-gluconate for our uh, data pipelines and also for my work in my smaller research team uh, for the last seven and a half years. That was a decision made early on. Um, in particular, we want um, a solution that can allow us to measure action potential firing. That's the one of the key things for our pipeline at the Allen Institute. Uh, and we all agreed early on, all the stakeholders, that that was a good choice. Uh, but going back to my postdoc, uh, we definitely played around with a lot of different internal solutions in the earlier days, whether it's potassium chloride or cesium-based, uh, cesium methane sulfonate, uh, lots of different things that we tried. My experience was that it was just a lot easier to get gigaohm seals with K-gluconate, especially freshly made um, and never frozen. Um, we, we do freeze the, the internal now, but um, if I'm really in a bind, what I do is make up fresh K-gluconate on that day um, and keep it in the fridge for um, several weeks or even a couple months if you can keep it clean. And I find that that improves the sealing speed a lot. But um, as far as the other ones, I think it's well known that cesium-based internal solution, uh, it's a little bit harder to get those giga-ohm seals. You have to work at it a little bit more. Uh -huh. uh, but it's necessary for especially a lot of the um, synaptic uh, physiology experiments. Got it. Well, that's some great advice for internal solutions. Um, let's see, I'm just going through the questions. Um, um, there were two questions asking about um, uh, mice psychological states and in, in how they relate to slice quality. So the, the questions are generally, um, does the mouse's uh, psychological state, so stress, anxiety, matter for producing slice quality? And somebody asked somebody uh, 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 similar, similarly, um, so uh, does the health status of the mouse contribute to slice quality? Those are great questions. Um, I don't know that I can answer them fully, but I can just give you a little of my thoughts on that. Uh, certainly we know that you don't wanna have mice that are super stressed out, that this can cause lots of changes. Um, we don't wanna be studying a, a stress model when we're just trying to record from our wild type control animals. Um, but uh, I've spent a lot of time talking with people about sort of the method of how you do um, 
IP injection uh, with the anesthetic, you know, do you scruff the animal or not to scruff the animal? Um, it's thought that if you scruff the animal and flip them over, that can be restraint stress is a little stressful. Uh, I tend to like the method where you hold the tail and you lift up and you insert the needle into the IP cavity that way where they're holding onto the bars and that seems to be less stressful. Um, whether or not that has a major impact on the, the, the recordings and the slice health, uh, I, I'm not uh, really prepared to answer that. I, I haven't looked at that carefully. Um, even just saying that it's been a while since I've done a lot of daily mouse brain slice prep uh, because we've been working so much in the primate uh, in the recent years. Um, but I think, you know, once you are doing this on a daily basis, you get better and you get faster. And I think that you can hit that happy, smooth sailing where you're not stressing the animals out. Um, but, you know, for most people who are new to, to the transcardio perfusion, uh, where you need to do an IP injection of anesthetic, uh, that's, that can take a while to develop that proficiency. Got it. And I think we're going to have time for maybe one or maybe two more questions. Um, but the, uh, this one is, um, so just in terms of embedding tissue, um, the compressed dome, we have a specimen tube, you can embed, embed the tissue in agarose or agar and then slice. Somebody asks, well, what if they use a different um, uh, tissue slicer model, such as like, like a Leica or a Camden, would you still recommend embedding the tissue in agar uh, when cutting? Or is just placing an agar block behind or in front of it sufficient? Yes, that's what I would do. I used to put agar blocks behind the tissue. It's a very standard approach for using like the Leica VT1000 or 1200S. Um, I don't believe you'll want to embed it. It will be very hard to cut. Uh, you may not have success with fully embedded tissue, although some people have adapted that machine for slicing on like um, fetal tissue, which is very soft and you need to embed it. But um, yeah, I think that the question is, how much time do you want to spend in the slicing and um, how mature is the tissue? And so, for example, if the speed is very important, that's one advantage of the compressed dome is by having that agarose embedding, you can slice in a much faster speed and still maintain really nice smooth uh, sections. Um, and when I was trying this, the Leica, which I still I still use on occasion, I like the Leica VT1200S with the VibraCheck. Um, when I use that on human tissue, it can just take forever. These are huge blocks of tissue sometimes, and uh, we can spend an hour, two hours on just sectioning, just straight sectioning block after block to get through uh, this tissue. So I think I would consider uh, the speed and the age and all of those factors um, when you're choosing what instrument you want to use. And um, the compressed dome has other advantages like being easy to move around the lab. Like I said, if you wanted to move into slice culture, uh, it was easy to move that thing into the, the biosafety cabinet as opposed to the very heavy um, uh, Leica instruments. Great, thank you. Okay, we're going to have one more question and it's about um, oxygenation. So somebody wrote, sometimes it's hard to tell how much oxygen is needed to give to the slices during the incubation process, whether it's too little or too much, since it's not controlled on the valve's knobs. Um, to what extent is the exact amount of oxygen critical? And what's the most important step in the oxygenation process under your experience? So multi-part question for you. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end this off with just some anecdotal evidence that will hopefully make people feel much better about this. Um, when I was in the lab working on adult mouse slices, uh, a lot of times uh, we would find out that the tank ran out and the slices hadn't been oxygenated for an hour or two, and people would start cursing and get really mad and say, I can't use any of this data anymore. It's no good. I'll tell you, my anecdotal evidence is that one time we, we started trying to keep these human slices overnight uh, and keep using them the next morning, and uh, at least one or two times we forgot and turned the, the, the carbogen off and came back the next morning and said, oh, what the heck, you might as well patch these cells, just see what's going on and could still obtain good recordings. And I think, again, that really challenges your notion of what's, you know, what, what, how you were trained and what you were trained to think. Um, oxygen is certainly important. You don't wanna have no oxygen, but maybe the oxygen does not really degas quickly. And that if you saturate the solution, uh, I think that will be sufficient. I, I really don't think people should be super overly concerned with exactly how precisely they're oxygenating. But if you really are concerned, what I would say is um, get a dissolved oxygen meter. You can get a little pen type meter like that and you can measure the dissolved oxygen levels. And if you want, you can use that to stay into a very, very tight range 
uh, and calibrate exactly as precisely as you'd like. But again, that's not something that I spend a lot of time worrying about as long as I can see that the oxygen is bubbling and I know that it's um, the right mixture of carbogen. Great. That's a great story, uh, Jonathan. It reminds us that sometimes um, things that we might have forgotten can uh, teach us something great, just like the discovery of penicillin, right? That sounds okay. like a little bit of a stretch for me on these very simple things. Hey, well, like just that. you wait. You never know. Yeah, we'll give you I mean, a couple I, more I, I years wanted, and then you come back to us. I just want to say thank you to the participants and encourage people that it wasn't intended to be the end. It was just intended to be the beginning. And I would very much like to incorporate changes that other people make to the methodology to help extend this for other applications and even applications that I could have never envisioned. And uh, it's been really fun uh, communicating with a lot of people about the methods and sharing the knowledge.